So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and on behalf of Lonza, I would like to welcome you to uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Fellner, and I'm the director of Cell Therapy Development uh, Services at Lonza. So I just uh, came back from Japan, uh, where I attended uh, the Science and Technology in Society Forum. And one of the speakers there was uh, Shinzo Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan. And uh, during his uh, keynote speech, he emphasized Japan's commitment to regenerative medicine. And he pointed out that especially the clinical translation of induced prepotent stem cells is one of the key objectives of his administration. So you might ask, why does this matter? It matters a lot to Lonza, and this is what I'm going to tell you in, uh, over the next 10 minutes. So I will uh, specifically address what we at Lonza have been doing to translate uh, Professor Yamanaka's uh, seminal invention and help move it towards uh, the clinic. But before I will do this, I will give you a brief introduction to Lonza because I'm uh, uh, pretty sure that not every one of you is familiar what Lonza is doing and who we are. Uh, and then also we'll talk a little bit about the prepotent stem cell program. I will then immediately tra uh, uh, switch over to point out the technical and economical challenges uh, we, as a manufacturer, believe need to be overcome before induced prepotent stem cell based therapies can become reality. And then I'm going to uh, tell you what we at Lonza have been doing in order to overcome these challenges by developing new technology, GMP compliant technologies that allow us to establish a process uh, for making clinical grade IPS cells. And then I will finish up uh, my presentation by giving you an update on the work we have been doing as part of a contract we have in place with the National Institute of Health uh, Center for Regenerative Medicine. So as promised, uh, a quick overview about Lonza. Lonza is a Swiss company. It's a life science driven company uh, with employing about 10,000 people. We have about 40 sites worldwide. Uh, but what's uh, most important for today's talk is uh, the cell therapy related activities like R&D, process development, and manufacturing of uh, cells is carried out in two sites. On the one hand, in Walkersville, which is outside uh, Washington, D.C., and then we also have a facility in uh, Singapore. So the prepotent stem cell program, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, about this uh, later, is also located in, in Walkersville, uh, outside uh, Washington, D.C. And so about two years ago, Lawrence's management decided to establish a pluripotent stem cell program with the belief that pluripotent stem cells are a key platform technology for the development of cell therapies. And the program's mission was on the one hand to establish or develop new technologies, but on the other hand provide a comprehensive service offering to our clients to help them bridge the gap between basic research and uh, cell therapy. So I would like to switch gear now and talk more specifically about the technical and economical challenges we as a manufacturer believe need to be overcome before induced pluripotent stem cell based therapies can become a reality. So just to reiterate, pluripotent stem cell have this gigantic promise uh, for the development of cell therapies because of the unique properties that they can self-renew, but also the propensity to differentiate into any cell type in our body. And co in contrast to human embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells can be utilized for the generation of autologous uh, uh, therapies. And in this case, a patient's own cells are used to generate iPS cells, and then the iPS cells are on the other hand used to generate therapeutic irrelevant cells, which will then in turn be used to treat the patient's disease. And since it's a patient's own cells, it's believed that they are not going to be rejected by the immune system. However, before any of these therapies that are based on iPS cells or human embryonic stem cells can become reality, we need to uh, overcome a few hurdles. And this is pretty much uh, summarizing the technical hurdles induced prepotent stem cell based therapies are facing. And I'm going to focus uh, especially on the manufacturing of the first part, which is making induced prepotent stem cell under CGMP compliant conditions. Uh, and the hurdles are very different depending on whether we talk about manufacturing of phase, oops, sorry, 
of phase one, material for phase one, two, or phase three and beyond. So the first hurdle that we need to overcome is to, ch to establish a robust, reproducible process to make induced peripotent stem cells under CGMB. Then further down the road, for phase three and commercial phase, we need a drastic change in technologies and processes. Because for allergenic therapies, we will need, uh, we will be, we need to uh, produce a huge amount of uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, while for autologous therapies, we will need to find ways to make ten hundreds or thousands of these iPS cells in parallel. So there are additional challenges to induce pluripotent stem cell-based therapies, and these challenges are of economical nature. So everyone, or those of you who are familiar with making IPS cells know that it takes about three to four months before you have an established, robust IPS line. So this lengthy process translates into relatively high cost, especially when we talk about manufacturing under CGMB compliant conditions. On average, uh, we estimate it, it costs about 20 uh, times more to make a CGMB compliant line than it costs to make a research grade line. So this is especially a problem when we talk about the development of induced pluripotent stem cell-based therapy in an autologous manner. Because in the autologous setting, unlike in the allergenic setting, the cost of manufacturing and testing cannot be allocated uh, or cannot be distributed to multiple patients. In the autologous model, the cost associated with manufacturing and testing is allocated to one patient. So uh, enough uh, with the problems, uh, and I hope uh, no one is now discouraged to, to look further into IPS-based therapies. Uh, I would also suggest we take it uh, one, uh, one hurdle at a time and focus on the immediate need. And the immediate need is to literally develop a robust, reproducible CGMB-compliant process to make clinical uh, great IPS cells. And over the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to show you what we at Lonza have been doing in order to achieve this goal, overcome this first hurdle by generating or by developing new technologies and by establishing a CGMB-compliant process for making induced pluripotent stem cells. I'm not going to go into uh, any details, but I just want to summarize that we have developed an entire reprogramming and culture system. And to my knowledge, this is the first reprogramming and culture system that allows you to generate uh, uh, IPS cells under defined, fully defined, CNO free and CGMB, uh, CGMB compliant uh, conditions. So we developed our own medium, and one of the uh, uh, features of this medium is that it allows you to culture cells without the need of feeding every day. So combined with some matrix and a passaging solution, it's a very robust uh, system that in combination with a reprogramming kit uh, allows you to generate IPS cells, as I said before, under CNO3, uh, defined, and CGB compliant condition. And this is pretty much shown on this slide. And in this case, we use CD34 positive cells, but I can uh, guarantee you the system works very well for other cell types, including PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, as well as uh, fibroblasts. Uh, we uh, generated uh, uh, multiple uh, of these lines in an R&D setting. We characterized them. I'm not going to go into any details here, but this is just to demonstrate that these cells are indeed stem cells, are indeed induced pluripotent stem cells. There is no trace of exogenous uh, episomal plasmids detectable after a couple of passages. In this case, we used episomal and episomal approach to reprogram. Uh, they maintain a normal carrier type. We have carried these cells out um, more than 40 passages, and the cells are indeed prepotent, as demonstrated by EB formation and uh, marker staining for all three germ layers. So I want to finish up my talk by uh, giving you a brief update on where we are in terms of actually manufacturing clinical grade IPS cells. And as I pointed out before, uh, this is done in, as part of a contract with the National Institute of Health Center for Regenerative Medicine, spearheaded by uh, Dr. Mahendra Rao. And so we are currently in the process of transferring uh, the uh, GMP IPS uh, process from an R&D lab into the cell therapy suites. And as part of this, we are currently carrying out engineering runs. So actual manufacturing of the first clinical grade master cell banks will occur in Q1 of uh, 2014. 
So that concludes my talk and uh, just summarizing it, induced pluripotent stem cell based CROBs uh, face uh, multiple challenges. Uh, new technologies and processes will be necessary in order to make it a commercially viable uh, therapy. But as a first step, we needed to move it from the preclinical to the clinical stage. We have established a CGMB compliant process. We are actually manufacturing clinical grade iPS cells. And uh, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. And please feel free uh, to ask any questions you have. Approach me, my colleague. Uh, who are here today and also will be here tomorrow if you have any other questions regarding pluripotent stem cells or any other manufacturing or process development questions. Thank you very much.